Well, it's noon, I think we should get started. Um, I wanted to thank all of you for tuning in today for an IGB Faculty Spotlight Lecture by Carl Gunter. Um, Carl is the George and Ann Fisher Distinguished Professor in Engineering at the U of I. Um, his research contributions in program languages, along with issues pertaining to security and privacy, um, have really influenced how languages and network protocols are currently being modeled and analyzed. His ongoing work is advancing security and privacy for power grids, for healthcare systems, as well as the so-called internet of things that uh, increasingly we have in our homes. In this regard, I should mention that Carl is a member of a NSF project that was funded for $10 million last year um, at, uh, you know, to look at um, smart home security, um, where their goal is to develop trustworthy devices and systems uh, for our home. Uh, Carl's the director of the Illinois Security Lab. He's the founding chair of the Security and Privacy Area and Computer Science Department. And here in the IGB, Carl leads the genomic security and privacy team. From the perspective of the IGB and from my perspective, I feel quite lucky that Carl is now focusing his considerable expertise in security and privacy on issues of genomic security, where there's uh, lots of need and there's lots of problems. And Carl's assembled a um, a really inspiring interdisciplinary group to address this in the relatively new GSP theme. And I think that's what we'll be hearing about today um, in Carl's lecture on recognizing and addressing securities and privacy concerns for the human genomic data. So Carl, please take it away. Well, thanks so much for taking a lunch time to uh, hear about this topic. I'm a computer scientist, but I've always been really fascinated by genomics and so this is a, a fantastic opportunity for me to get to work in the intersection of the, those areas. And, and so part of the, the goal here is for me to convince you that's an interesting uh, spot, the, both for those of you who do uh, genetics and, and genomics and uh, versus also you know, computer scientists. So let's get started. Okay, so Genomics started coming in as a, a sort of widespread topic, human genomics, with recognition uh, with the uh, Human Genome Project, uh, showing that sequencing could be done at first, you know, in, in, uh, with quite a high expense, and then increasingly uh, at lower expense. But people were worried about, like, what the, people didn't know actually what their genome shows, and so there was a kind of fear that it was like there was some sort of a Pandora's box to be found when. A genome sequencing occurred. And so if your genome was um, discovered, uh, who knows what that might say about you and how people might treat you as a result of what they found out. So this led to kind of dystopian visions like a uh, Gattaca movie, uh, which uh, in, envisions a you know, very high level of knowledge of people's behavior and uh, uh, the use of that information to uh, manipulate and slot them into, into their you know, their role in life uh, with a, a loss of freedom uh, resulting from that. So, so that you see here the, the McGuire and Evans papers, these are in Nature in 2008. Um, these are uh, in a debate called genetic exceptionalism, which was, is, is, gen is genomic data really that much different from other lab results, uh, other medical results? And so could you, for example, keep the, uh, the genome sequencing of a person as part of their electronic health records file. And so on the one hand, there was a view that there's just too much sensitive data and too much unknown about genomic data for you to make it like mainstream available uh, for, for people at any at scale versus others who felt like, you know, if you didn't open up, you were going to impede the progress of the field. And so a theme we'll see kind of again and again is that for the field to be useful, it, it needs to be open to some degree because that's how you discover the association between the genomics and the, uh, the phenotype or people's behavior. Now, looking at this, uh, here's a, a kind of a pinwheel on like what's special about DNA. Um, it does have some notable features. So let's start with its uniqueness, except for uh, identical twins. Uh, everybody has their own uh, unique DNA. It's also static, meaning uh, with notable exceptions, it stays the same throughout a lifetime. Uh, it has implications for health and behavior. 
Uh, it's determinative of kinship uh, to you know, brother, sister, and beyond. Uh, and um, uh, it has value, so meaning that the data is not useless. You can do, uh, often it's quite actionable. Something you know, can be done to treat a condition that's uh, got a, gen a genetic origin. Um, but above all, it's got a mystique. And so you can see that in the Gattaca movie that there's a, something about the DNA data that goes well beyond just the sum of the other ones of these things. And so that mystique has to be taken into account when you're trying to get people to cooperate with you in doing things in genomics. And in particular, thinking about security and privacy concerns. So let's, this is a, um, so as a computer scientist and a security uh, researcher, uh, you, you start with the threats. Like, what are you really worried about here? What do you, what do you think might happen? And, and Gattaca, well, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a little far-fetched maybe. So maybe there are some more routine things that would happen a little bit more, uh, you know, earlier. And so let, let's look at a few of those. So there's this paper of um, Ehrlich, uh, 2014 paper that summarizes these first three criteria up here. And then I've added one and I'll talk about each one of them in turn. So let's start with uh, identity tracing, which is, this is the idea that you have some DNA and you're trying to figure out whose DNA it is. Okay, so that you wanna associate it with someone. Um, that's the kind of common thing you would see in sort of forensic contexts, like you see DNA at a crime scene and you wanna know whose DNA it is. Um, and uh, if it's, um, but it has a, a, an important implication for research uh, in genomics, which is that uh, DNA, if you can identify it based on quasi-identifiers, by what this means is like, you know, male and female, uh, you know, area of the country you live, color of skin, and this sort of thing, various kinds of, uh, you know, racial group and such. Um, and so if DNA can be traced back to its owner, then it's kind of intrinsically identified. And so ideas about trying to do things with de-identified data where you take the name and social security number off and then work with it anonymously, uh, those will fail because they will, the, the DNA is itself already um, too uh, defining to, to be de-anonymized, to, uh, to be anonymized. Uh, another uh, possibility is attribute disclosure. So Alice comes for a job interview uh, drinks out of a mug, you sequence the genome that you get from the mug and find that Alice has conditions that would strain your company's healthcare budget uh, and so that you don't make the hire. And so that would be an attribute disclosure. You know the person involved, uh, you just don't know something about them that can be learned by finding out about their DNA. Another one is completion, which is you'll get fragments of DNA and uh, then um, from those fragments, you want to infer properties about parts that are missing. And so that'll become a little more significant later as I go through, you'll see why this one turns out to be like a big deal. It was also one of the earliest ones to be encountered in practice. And then finally misuse, which is people using DNA for a purpose that they're not supposed to use it for. Okay, so let's start with completion. It's not, not the first one on my list. Uh, but it's in a way one of the first ones that came in, and it's pretty easy to understand at a certain level at least. Uh, when uh, James Watts, uh, uh, Watson was uh, getting his uh, genome sequenced for hundreds of millions of dollars uh, at the early, early days, uh, he was asked, you know, are there any parts of the genome that you would prefer us not to tell people about? Okay, and so he chose the APOE gene, which uh, it has uh, markers for our early onset dementia uh, and um, so, uh, sorry, late onset dementia. And, and so that the um, uh, concern was that this, um, uh, you know, would be revealing of too much about, uh, about him uh, or maybe he didn't want to know. So whatever the reason, the thinking was, let's take the part of the genome that, um, you know, is the worry here and let's redact it. Okay, and so then uh, it will help protect privacy and, uh, and will encourage the sharing of genomic data. The problem with this was that as research went on, it became clear that um, you could learn things about some parts of the DNA by learning things about other parts of the DNA because uh, the, uh, the, the various value, the, the alleles were not um, uh, statistically independent from one another. And so if you could look at other parts 
and use a concept of what they call linkage disequilibrium, which is this lack of uh, this lack of independence. You can infer values that you didn't know uh, from values that you do know. And so this Nyholt paper here made the point in 2009 already that it was, our, it was gonna be quite a challenge to hide any part of the DNA by redacting it. And so if you're sharing things that are not very sensitive, then how you tease that apart from things that are very sensitive is gonna be an interesting problem. And that'll come up later in the lecture. Now, there's a particularly good example of identity tracing um, in the Golden State Killer uh, case. Um, this, in, in a way, came sooner than people expected it to come. Uh, the, you could get the DNA of the, um, uh, of the attacker in this case, but then figuring out which individual went with that DNA was another matter. And so the way this was eventually done was using genetic genealogy which is you use the DNA together with databases for finding relatives to find some of the killer's relatives. And then from the relatives, you kind of hone in on individuals, a short list of individuals that could be the killer. And in this case, they went and surreptitiously got further DNA from him that confirmed uh, that he was the guy and, and so that they, they caught him. Okay, and so now, but what you may know, so probably all of you have heard of this, what you may be less familiar with is that um, as of, this is an early paper in 2018, um, about 60% of searches for individuals of European descent will provide a third cousin or closer match. In other words, finding your relatives is not that hard with the kind of databases people are building out there where they contribute their DNA in order to help them search for family members. And uh, the expectation from the, predicted from the paper was that people of European descent uh, will pretty much um, uh, any of them uh, be subject to implication by these techniques uh, pretty soon, uh, if not already. Okay, so that's identity tracing. Now let's look at attribute disclosure. So this is um, a, a paper, I'll use as an interest, I already mentioned the example of um, uh, like the job interview scenario. Um, this is an interesting case uh, from 2008 again, um, and this is a uh, Homer et al. Uh, results. The idea here was, suppose you can know some SNPs, that is a single nucleotide polymorphism values of, a, of someone's genome, then uh, you could maybe use that um, information to find out if they were in a crime scene where there's a mixture of DNA present. And so this is a considered quite hard problem. And so what this paper does is that they show that indeed they can figure out a way to do it. So don't need to look at the details here about the allele frequencies and distance measure. But the point is that you take the, what you found at the crime scene as a mix, here we go, and then you would be able to take individual samples and be able to tell with a certain probability whether they were part of the mix or not, okay? And so if it's something most likely to be in the mixture, then if you only have a portion of the information there, you can still conclude that someone is part of the crime scene or was, was present at the crime scene with some confidence, okay? And it, now that, that was a notable result, but perhaps it got its best um, uh, recognition, this result, uh, for its implications for privacy. Because at the time, uh, NIH would release these uh, allele frequency results uh, to the public, and you would also release information about the uh, results of clinical studies. And so the clinical studies with their allele frequencies allowed you to tell if somebody was part of an NIH study or not. And so for example, if the NIH did a study on schizophrenia and you had someone's genome, you could tell uh, with a certain probability whether or not they were part of that study uh, based on these allele frequencies. And so this caused NIH to pull down the allele frequencies data. Um, and it, it's part of a kind of ongoing lesson of, you may have thought you couldn't figure it out from this, but in fact, you know, you can. And in this case, it's really surprisingly small. They, they can get by with a tenth of a percent of the data coming from the target individual and still tell with confidence whether the individual uh, was part of the mix. Now, here's an example from misuse. Uh, going back to the Gattaca story, there was plenty of enthusiasm for uh, doing some kind of regulation to make sure that the worst things didn't happen with this. And so that, that resulted in the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act of 2008, GINA is called. 
And so GINA provided a variety of protections uh, against, say, uh, uh, your, you know, the, the, it, it would illegalize the case I gave earlier of the uh, uh, in potential employee uh, touching a mug and then being sequenced. That would be illegal under GINA. Um, and also covers um, uh, health insurance uh, for, um, you know, you can't use the DNA to, to judge a person's rates. On the other hand, it doesn't cover other things. For example, um, certain kinds of employment like in the military or insurance. And so there's still a degree to which, you know, people may be surprised by what their DNA could be used for. And that will get to be more interesting as now there are new kinds of genomic tests that are based on dynamic DNA or omics data, such as epigenetic timers that give estimates of what is the age of various parts of the body. And so, for example, you could take a sample from a liver and tell you know, how, how old the liver is. Okay? Uh, and so these things are legal and could become part of um, uh, insurance tests in the future. Now, another example, this is uh, going back before uh, genomic, um, uh, the se genomic sequencing uh, was a well-known case of Henrietta Lacks, uh, died of uh, cancer in the 1950s in Johns Hopkins Medical. Uh, a sample was taken of her tumor and uh, it was um, uh, remarkably the first um, human cell that could be grown in a lab. And so it became a, a benchmark for sharing um, uh, cells that could be used in tests, a huge contribution to, um, uh, to medical science. However, at the time, it wasn't customary to tell people that you were going to take their um, tissue samples, let alone you know, what you were going to use them for. And so they would, um, they would take the tissue, they, they took the tissue without permission to use it for these purposes. Uh, this um, became controversial with the family and um, had, had a, a long history of negotiation. Uh, it's been a tremendous favorable impact on medical research, uh, but also uh, you know, caused some people to feel like they were being exploited. And now another more recent case that did actually involve uh, genomics per se, so this was a laxus of the cell line, uh, the Havasupai tribe had an agreement to having DNA sequencing taken, and they would use that um, uh, for uh, finding correlations with uh, causes of diabetes in the tribe, where there was a, a, a widespread problem with that. And so the hope was to understand better what, it, what its preconditions were. They subsequently found that some efforts were being made uh, by the um, parties that took the data to use it for things that um, uh, were to them upsetting, the Havasupai tribe that is, things about um, migration patterns uh, and uh, uh, the conditions like schizophrenia. And so this one went to court and there was a $700,000 settlement against Arizona State University for the way it was using the um, uh, Havasupai tribe's DNA uh, and the return of the DNA. And this, this case is very widely um, re you know, uh, referenced now with respect to uh, efforts to think, how do we get a, a diverse set of DNA samples so everybody can participate in the advances uh, if there are parties that are maybe made mistrustful by the way they've been handled in the past. Okay. now. Um, I, I could have gone on with a few other kinds of, I thought one kind of far out threat would be worth uh, showing here. So this one is um, a DNA exploit. And so you're, you're probably familiar with the idea that, you know, you take a file, say, and you can upload it to a computer and it does a buffer overflow and you can gain control of the computer. This is like a typical kind of uh, hacker scenario. The question here was, could I get this little shell code, here it is, to run on the back end of a DNA uh, sequencing um, computer, uh, computerization by giving it a bad DNA result that was like a buffer overflow with DNA, okay? And where I mean when I say with DNA, they don't get this. They get instead a DNA synthesis, they get a, a, you know, a, a synthetic DNA, that is a collection of DNA molecules. And so these go in the DNA sequencer, which produces a FASTQ file, which when it's put through a certain pipeline causes an exploit to be triggered, which allows us a reverse shell callback to the attacker 
so that they have, now they have control of machines in your uh, pipeline for doing sequencing. Okay, so, so this um, technique was um, uh, by uh, Peter Ney and, and others in 2017. Uh, I thought this one was particularly noteworthy because it actually inspired a science fiction or, or, or rather a murder mystery. So um, uh, Michael Connolly's Fair Warning book, this exploit is used in part to, as part of the, the, the plot. Uh, I won't spoil how, but um, uh, basically it's a, um, a DNA exploits um, uh, murder mystery. Okay, so I hope I've convinced you that there are a range of notable threats and that they're not just the usual thing, right? And, and when I say the usual thing, I mean, if I'm a security researcher and someone asks me for a list of things that are problems, you know, I can say, well, there's a denial of service attack, there is a remote exploit with a buffer overflow and so on. But, you know, these things are like, they have their own special features. Often they blend with probability theory and with uh, the uh, biology. Um, and, and so that there's some special features there. But a kind of core problem that you find is, given its identifiability, how do you get an aggregate of DNA together to allow people to make a scientific conclusion about it without hurting the privacy of the people that are involved? Okay, so I wanna kind of focus on that problem. It's particularly important for researchers. Um, and so, there are four primary techniques that are out there. And I'm gonna say a little bit about each one and what its pros and cons are. And then I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on thinking about the uh, fourth one and, and what its um, possible mitigations might be. Okay, so let's, uh, let's start with one, which is this integrated access control and audit. The idea there is you control who gets access to the DNA. So maybe the DNA would identify a person, but you never let a bad person look at the DNA and, and abuse that privilege, okay? And so uh, these are our approximate techniques. And so you use audit to see if maybe a violation has occurred. And then you take someone who violated, uh, you know, the uh, privacy and you, you, don't, you don't give them permission in the future. And so uh, the idea here is only trusted people handle the data and that reduces your risk. Now, another idea is, well, let's, let's try to avoid trusting anyone uh, except you know, through technical means of protection that will make it the case that they simply can't do anything bad. So cryptography that enables a trusted third party is a strategy for this. Cryptographers are always coming up with uh, techniques of doing things you would have thought were impossible. And so like, you know, able to like how you would be able to uh, assure that someone knows the answer to a question without knowing the answer yourself and you know, things and many, many things of this kind. And so um, the uh, um, cryptographic techniques uh, have been one of the most explored and heavily invested in by NIH, for example, with multiple studies. Another variant here, something that kind of contrasts with it is a trusted hardware execution. So now this is like a trusted third party. I'll talk about it in more detail later, of course, but um, it's, it's effectively trusting large vendors of hardware um, because they're kind of remote. They can form a root of trust where you don't feel like you're giving the data away to somebody that you don't trust, or at least that's the reasoning here. And then finally, um, the fourth one, the one I'll talk about in more detail is a direct consumer testing where you have basically consumers, that is people, you know, individuals in control of their DNA and deciding how to share it. And I'll talk about that one in some more detail. Okay, so let's get started with this, this list here of uh, the approaches. So let's start with integrated access control and audit. I'm not gonna try to be comprehensive about this at all. Um, uh, I'm just wanting to focus on one particular idea and technique that um, uh, has some promise. Uh, so this is, uh, the, the idea here is that, that what you really like is open access, okay? And so that there's a thing called the Thousand Genomes Project where people could contribute their genome. The genome would be put up in its entirety, um, not with your name associated with it, but just the entire genome. And so you get privacy through the fact that people couldn't do uh, the tracing uh, of the data um, and or, or you didn't care about privacy. So like, the, you know, the James Watson case, you know, maybe people knew, you know, whose DNA this was. And so that's nice because, you know, it's then an open science problem. <clears throat> and so 
anybody can come in, get, get materials and, and do their own research projects. And actually as part of this project, we did that. We went and uh, snarfed up genomes of people that had made public contributions of that data to allow us to do tests. So that's great when it's possible. Now, another uh, alternative is controlled access where you have um, the um, access control committees that review um, uh, the requests for access to data. Uh, DBGAP from uh, NIH is one of the best known examples of this. And it's been often noted that it's kind of hard work to get stuff from them. It takes a while and it's not very conducive for uh, science in a sort of discovery mode. Like, you know, you're not sure whether you need some data, but if you ran a test, you would know afterwards whether it was useful to you. Maybe, you know, you should let them run the test as long as it's pretty, you know, there's pretty good confidence it's not gonna cause any harm. And so the thought here is, to go from this controlled access to one where you put more trust in the individuals that are doing the searches and they call this registered access. Okay, and so this registered access is a, you know, proposed policy of GA for GH, it's an organization on sharing genomic data. And it looks at questions like, well, maybe what I can do is to get trusted researchers that come from places that, that you know, we're familiar with where they don't like, do anything you know that isn't carefully regulated, and then get them to sign on to. You see here these consent codes, so very detailed descriptions of what they're allowed to do, where they themselves judge how to do it. Now, so you think back of the have a supai tribe example, you might have been able to address it there. So maybe if the consent codes were precise enough, then when they were working out the deal with the have a supai over whether the over the diabetes study, it would have been clear whether it could be used for any other purpose. Okay, so this is promising for a number of reasons. Um, it's kind of close to co uh, current methods um, and there are already limited versions of it. They do do audits on their systems already. Um, and it can be widely deployed, it's very scalable. In fact, it's a kind of technique that's used for medical records in hospitals. And so computer scientists refer to this as an optimistic model. So what they mean is that you let them have access and then you audit the result of the access and, and often that's you know, efficient, but it does require that you have to be able to tell how much harm is gonna come. So remember, you know, this is always this problem of how much damage does like finding out someone's DNA cause? Is that like really bad? Or you know, is that something that's not so bad? And, and so we're not in a position where we really know what the risks are very Okay, so as I mentioned, another approach here is cryptography. So uh, the goal with cryptography is to design what you call a semi-trusted party. Um, and they use, they refer to the group of things called privacy enhancing technology. And, and so the, the, um, the idea is that you could trust Intel um, or you could have a mathematical way, a programmatic way of, of doing the trust so that a third party is defined not by, you know, trust relationships with the business, but with the mathematics and the, uh, you know, the underlying structures of the um, computation. So an, an example of this is homomorphic encryption. And so the idea here is you can add two numbers, M plus N, but you can do it without knowing what M and N are if there's a special function that works on the encrypted values. And so you can add the numbers from their encrypted values and so you don't know what the two numbers are and you don't know what the result of adding them is. But what you do know is that if someone knows how to decrypt the result, they'll get M plus N. So this allows you to do computations on the data without knowing the data. And so you can gather it all together, run a collection of calculations, uh, and then that uh, you know, could be used. Another whole class of things like this are multi-party computations. Um, and so the idea with this is that you have three people, they have values X, Y, and Z, they want to calculate the function f of x, y, z. And so uh, what you want to do, though, is calculate it so that none of them learns the value of x. Only the person who contributed x knows the value x, and only the one contributing y knows the value y. And so what, the, what at the end they know is um, each of the parties knows its respective input and the uh, total output f of x, y, z, but nothing else. Okay? And so this is what this kind of technique is able to do. 
Um, and, and then another example is a, a technique called garbled circuits is used for this. So it's a kind of, kind of a circuit model with um, uh, an encryption. And um, the, uh, another example, uh, and I could have a longer list here, but I just want to give a few to give a taste of the kind of variety. Uh, functional encryption allows you to produce keys that can be used to do decryptions that answer only specific questions. That is, um, uh, the, the, you know, a certain function can be calculated on the input. So you take the key and you don't decrypt and get everything, you just get the uh, value of a particular function. Now, these things are often done in a, what we call a semi-trusted technique or honest but curious. Um, and the, the kind of model here is take a sysadmin who, you know, takes care of computers and email they may have access to everyone's email in clear text, like they can read your email. It's not like considered a very virtuous thing for them to be doing, but every now and then maybe it's part of their job, like they're supposed to look at email and see if it's got an exploit in it. And so um, uh, the result is that the parties don't have to do anything like very active in terms of compromising the system. Uh, but on the other hand, if you put some piece of sensitive information in front of them so they can see it, you know, then they're going to note that. Okay, so that's the kind of criteria they're used. And so one could argue, you know, is that good enough? Like, um, you know, is it, is it okay to assume that they're, you know, you don't trust them, but on the other hand, um, you know, you're going, you're, you're going to trust them only partially in this way. Like, uh, you know, what if they are malicious, you know, then how do you know that they're only honest but curious and, um, and so on. So anyway, this is a kind of one of the uh, issues with cryptography. On the other hand, um, mathematical proofs of correctness can be provided. And so that's brilliant when you can get that. And uh, you can get implementation in software so that you don't have to rely on people having special types of equipment, for example. Now it does, its main impediment is, uh, is the requirement of a large amount of computation in, in many cases. Okay, and so the um, uh, efficiency uh, is often determined by looking at the specifics of the application and trying to use those specifics in order to make the thing efficient. So the result is that you have a bunch of different techniques and they each solve pieces of the puzzle with varying degrees of efficiency. But when you're trying to solve a problem, you may not fit one of those or maybe you need a combination of things that doesn't exist. And so that um, there's not like ready off the shelf works for everything kinds of solutions. By contrast, these things called trusted execution environments are basically just computers. And so if you can solve a problem on a computer, then you can use this approach. And so therefore it doesn't suffer from the problem that I was just describing of, it, of its being the case that you have to look around and find just the right solution. Uh, this is just, you know, you use the same thing kind of for everything here, all right? So, so <clears throat> the, the sharing is cumbersome. So <clears throat> what you'd ideally like to do is to collect data sets from all the parties and then compute on the aggregated data set, but in a protected area, protected with a, with a hardware protected third party agent. Um, and you can do this with a, a kind of system here, this, uh, the trusted execution environment uh, provide hardware mechanisms for doing that. Now on the advantage side, it's coming down the pipeline. So the SGX is uh, an Intel version of this and you can buy inexpensively machines that have one of these kinds of protective spaces. Um, and it's a general purpose solution, which I just said uh, earlier, and it supports all the common programming techniques. On the other hand, it does have some drawbacks, like it requires special hardware, uh, which is, you know, drives up your costs, of course, and is uh, not always convenient. Um, there can be limits on memory. Those are being addressed over time, but still, um, it's a problem. Um, and they're not standardized. So if you had multiple vendors doing this, you'll get multiple routes of trust as a result. And so that there'll be a question of how this works on a, on a global scale. Okay, so those approaches one, two, and three. Now, Oh, let's see. So, oh yes, okay, and I, I almost forgot to say one of the problems too is, unlike the mathematical techniques where you can provide a proof of correctness, 
it's very hard to take the hardware and assure that there's nothing that allows people to make inferences about what's being done on the hardware. And so this um, is uh, uh, particularly characterized by what we call microarchitectural side channels, which is the computation gives some hint of the information of information about what the input data was. Okay, um, so let's go to this fourth case, and this is kind of one of the more fanciful strategies, but uh, I, I hope to convince you it's got a lot of interesting temptations and um, so people are, are working on it for in, in a serious way. Um, now you might imagine like in the first step, getting genomic data would be done by uh, you know, an NIH grant and they would go out and carefully collect data uh, and biobank it and uh, make sure all the parties are known and the data is trustworthy and kept good track of and so on. So that's kind of the ideal and we're still in that phase mostly uh, for, for genomic data. A next stage of that might be that people are generating clinical records as part of routine hospital care. And then they're beginning to form a database uh, of that information. Um, and so many of the hospitals like uh, Mayo Clinic we, we work with has you know, programs to collect uh, genomic data. And so they'll build you know, databases of uh, clinical data uh, associated with genomic data, which can be very valuable for research. Okay, so that's kind of also very trustworthy, but also very institutional. So another thing you might ask is, well, what about the possibility that the consumer gets their own DNA and decides who gets it and then they can share it around? So, uh, so that's got some pros and cons, okay? So one of the pros is it's a very dynamic you know, kind of thing. So it can, go, it can go at kind of considerable scale and has done uh, you know, compared to techniques like NIH funding a study that's in a particular, um, you know, with, with the limits that that would have. Uh, if you're just talking about individual people getting their DNA, there's cheap ways of doing that these days. And that you know, could in principle lead to a lot of data available for studies. Okay, and it has, of course, this basic, uh, you know, thing of you're putting the choices in the hands of the subjects. So again, thinking back to like the have a soup by tribe kind of problem that if you know, parties controlled their data a little better, then there might've been less chance of a misunderstanding. Okay, and so you're gonna kind of have a principle of I'm free to do as I wish with data about my own body. Okay, and so if, uh, if it's my sequencing, I get to decide what I do with it. Now, on the other hand, it creates an insecure ecosystem. Uh, and I'll, I'll give a little more detail on that in, in, a, in a minute, but um, the, the point is that there are few, um, protections here guaranteeing the integrity of the process. Also, the, the confidentiality is a question, like you know, exposing when you share your genome with a party, maybe they only need a portion of it, but you're, you know, without the tools to give them only a portion, you may have to give them all of it, okay? And so you may be giving away a lot more information than you expect or wish to give away. All right, but <laughs> it's now, a, you know, putting it in the hands of the subject is now a problem as well, right? Which is, I'm burdened with decisions I may not have the knowledge to make. <clears throat> in fact, any of us, I think, would be burdened with a problem that, you know, it's hard to decide what the impacts of these things would be. Um, and so that uh, there, there's a risk that people will, um, you know, not know what they're doing before they leap, you know, so they, they leap into this and then it's uh, a cause for regret. Now, uh, turning to 23andMe, um, so the, uh, uh, this is a, um, a direct-to-consumer space, they call it, okay? And so 23andMe uh, was a, a key pioneer in this area. And what you're seeing here on the screen is the old 23andMe, um, where they would take something like prostate cancer and predict that your chances of getting it are 29.3% compared to the population average, which is 17.8% which means you better watch out for prostate cancer because you've got a, uh, an extra specially high risk of that compared to the general population, okay? That's a pretty high per percentage for both of them, but especially here. Now, 23andMe uh, built its business on this. They, they attracted millions of users, um, but FDA was not comfortable with the uh, kind of information like you see here 
being made available to the public as conforming to U.S. law concerning uh, the, these, um, uh, this kind of information um, here, which has medical implications. And so they, they asked 23andMe to um, take this down. 23andMe engaged with FDA and came back with a new system in which it has FDA approval, but it's much more limited than this. The set of results is smaller and, and um, uh, less, um, well, it doesn't contain this kind of information, uh, mostly. Now, in the case of 23andMe, you can see kind of it's at the edge, like they flip over into FTC regulation uh, uh, when uh, the, the, uh, the time, sorry, FDA regulation when the time comes. Um, but, you know, others are going to avoid uh, any kind of regulation if, if at all possible. So here's an example. This is Gene Partner. So this is like where you go out and you get testing to see if you're compatible with your um, uh, girlfriend or boyfriend. And then if you get gene testing, you can be as happy as those people are there. And um, so uh, in this case, <coughs> you might say, well, that's kind of not very scientific. Like, you know, maybe we don't know much about like how genomics influences whether people get along with one another or not. On the other hand, it's not entirely not scientific either because there are recessive traits issues that might come up and those can be quite serious. And so we're kind of an edge of uh, like this is a wild west kind of environment here uh, with respect to genomics. So I wanna do two case studies um, uh, that just show something you can maybe, some things to try on approach four. And these are research projects that I'm hoping we can pursue in IGB. Uh, and we have uh, teams that are looking at parts of these things. And so um, let, let me familiarize you with them. So the first one's called in silico uh, home, uh, genetic home testing. <clears throat> and the second one's called sign and mask. And this is uh, particularly a uh, uh, joint work with Jing Yu Qian, a, a PhD student in computer science, uh, has uh, written the prototypes and designed the protocols. Okay, so let's, let's look at what's happening since the collapse of 23andMe's you know, early days. Okay, so what, what's, what's happening with that? Okay, and so you start with the consumer and here's the general pattern. The consumer goes to a laboratory with a sample the laboratory sequences the sample and gives it to a DTC service. That would be like 23andMe. And the purpose of the DTC service is basically to take raw laboratory results and put them in a form in which a consumer would be ready to receive them. So for example, this might be uh, very low level files and so on of, uh, of data and that the consumer would not be able to handle those and so you would reduce them to something you know, uh, that would be more manageable. So I'll show you some examples <clears throat> of the sort of reports that you can get this way. Okay, so the DTC service then uh, gives that information to the consumer. Now the DTC service then might or might not have various things that the consumer can look at like, you know, um, predictions of traits, you know, uh, or do you, do you have dry earwax or not, you know, and so on. Uh, but the consumer then is free to go out to a space of analysts um, in, the, in you know, the ecosystem generally and give them your, the DNA data they have as a download from the DTC service for purposes uh, of, uh, well, whatever the analyst does, okay? So for example, um, GEDmatch was the one in the Golden State Killer and people would go to GEDmatch with 23andMe uh, raw data files put them into the system and then those would be used to find relatives. And so that was like a big draw for many people finding their uh, relatives. And so note, by the way, 23andMe has a service like that, uh, but um, it only covers the 23andMe customers and there are a lot of non 23andMe customers. And so the analyst here was offering a service that was much broader than what 23andMe could by itself do. Okay, so let's talk about the first technology here. And so um, this one's I'm gonna call it in silico genetic home testing. So sometimes people refer to genetic home testing, meaning 23andMe sends me something and I spit into it at home, okay? But I'm thinking here of home testing where you get some sample, you, you get your, your um, test and you um, use it to get an answer, okay, at home. All right, so, and, and so, you 
have a collection of techniques we've just discussed with access crawl controls and cryptography and TEEs and so on, but they're very institutionally oriented and they're not necessarily easy to understand, right? So the average consumer is not going to be much reassured perhaps when they're told that their data is protected by homomorphic encryption, they probably won't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Okay? And so, so that having a circumstance in which things are easier to explain, that has a certain virtue to it, okay? So many of the tests that are being done in these uh, scenarios, like with, the, uh, with these models up here, <coughs> um, are, are not particularly complicated. They're not secret. They've been like vetted publicly um, and, and they're not particularly expensive to perform unless you're doing them uh, with, you know, uh, cryptography typically would be, you know, what makes them expensive. If they were being done inside of a TEE, for example, they would perform quite quickly. <clears throat> and so also they often don't require anything more than a single genome, uh, at least for certain functions. So thought is, well, what if a user brings the test to their data rather than giving their data to the analyst? Okay, so in other words, bring the test to me. So the analogy here, as I just mentioned, is a test you can run in the privacy of your own home, here being analogized to run a test on your genome in the privacy of your own smartphone. Okay, so one virtue of this is that at least at some level, the privacy is easy to understand, right? So I contributed my data, it ran with a homomorphic encryption, it was protected in certain ways because of that. Well, here, the, answer, the explanation is it never left your cell phone. So it was everything that was needing to be done to give you the answer to a question was on your cell phone. Okay, so now here's how the scenario goes. So an analyst goes to an app store and puts an app. A DTC service offers a hosting app uh, on the consumer's smartphone. Then the consumer downloads from the app store the analyst app, okay? And the analyst app then, to do its job, contacts the, um, in the fourth step, contacts the genome host app, gets a, a temporary, grants temporary access to the data to the um, analyst app and then runs the app on the genome uh, data. Okay, and so this is basically the, the test then is being done uh, within um, the consumer's smartphone. Now at the end, the um, app here could request a masked genome for, for this. And I'll say what masked means in a little while uh, as time allows. And you're gonna send it to the analyst, okay? And so in other words, it could be that you do send something to the analyst if you wish, okay? And so that's optional. <coughs> uh, or you could just go with whatever you get locally on your system. Now to try to test this in terms of expressiveness, we looked at uh, homomorphic encryption um, it, for this Karimi paper in 2020 just came out. Um, and so it's used to do case studies on clinical decision applications, CDS applications. So here are the three they, they look at. Um, eligibility for APOE haplotypes uh, for a, a, a clinical trial, screening for high cholesterol tendencies uh, based on pathogenic variants, and a level of interaction uh, with, between a pair of, with, with, with the drug. Okay, and <clears throat> so, we, we looked in the details at these and each of them can be implemented as an app. Or for that matter, you could have one app that implements all three of them. And the computations on the cell phone are essentially instantaneous, it's quite quick, despite the fact that you are having to search through the genome for this, but you don't have to do big global tests. It's usually searching for a particular portion of the genome to look for certain SNPs. And, um, the privacy is easy to understand. You never left the, the data. Now, this is all kind of nice. I mean, I, it means it's efficient. Um, you don't need uh, special techniques for this, but it's not to say that th th there's not a big contribution here from the homomorphic encryption. Um, the, the home testing here doesn't support the learning phase for these things. So this is more like in a use phase. So once you've learned what you need to do in order to make a conclusion, 
you know, then you can make this available and it can be used at home. All right, now uh, I, I mentioned this before that this, this architecture here <coughs> um, is pretty freewheeling. <coughs> and so there is a vulnerability to attacks. And so some recent work here, the, uh, this is again, Peter Ney um, and, and the, uh, this other group from uh, uh, Davis uh, Edge um, showed how you could go to a, an analyst like GEDmatch and give them fake data. And then they would do analytics on it from which you could learn information about their database. And so basically it's a way of attacking the privacy of the individuals in the database by putting up false or, or you know, incomplete or selectively chosen kinds of queries uh, into the analyst. And you can even do some <clears throat> pretty um, uh, interesting things like putting in false people into the database that would help uh, protect you from a genetic genealogy search. So basically decoys. And so, so these things um, mean that you're, you're gonna have problems with this ecosystem if you don't tighten up the security. And so there's some suggestions here. I wanna talk a little bit about another way you might do that. So this is called uh, sign and mask. And so what you want to do here is to have something like 23andMe effectively do a digital signature uh, on the data that they're giving. So you have a goal of having 23andMe protect the data, or at least you know, indicate that they created it. Okay? It doesn't mean that it's your data, uh, because they can't easily check that. Um, on the other hand, it would allow it to be the case that in the scenario back here, you could insist that only data that's signed be processed. And that would assure a certain baseline of integrity of the system, because this would be data that came from say large trusted DTC vendors. All right, so um, you could um, uh, do things with uh, cryptography or trusted environments. Um, the, the files here are big, um, half a million to a million lines uh, of this. Here's an example of what they look like. So this is a tiny snip from chromosome one uh, of uh, a, um, uh, the variant calls from 23andMe for someone. And, um, and so this is the kind of thing you're handing off to the, uh, to the party, you know, to, to the um, uh, analyst. Now, it would be nice if you could just fail to give them parts that are sensitive. So like, what about really sensitive pieces of the genome, uh, like here, the cystic fibrosis um, uh, value. And so this one is um, uh, indicating a, uh, a recessive trait that has a lot of significance. And so maybe you would prefer not to communicate that. And so could you do these two things at the same time? Could you sign the data so there's integrity, but at the same time, hide the parts of it that uh, you, know, you consider to be unneeded for the purpose in question. And our goal here was to do this in such a way as you didn't have to say, contact the DTC service anymore. Like, you know, you don't have to go back to 23andMe for any further signatures. There's a variety of reasons why you'd wanna do that. Um, first of all, you know, you prefer not, 23andMe would more likely want to implement a service that they didn't have to constantly continue to provide a service, you know, over time to the parties who wanted it, but they could do things themselves without contacting 23andMe. Another motive is that it'd be nice not to reveal what you're trying to hide, right? So, you know, you don't want to have to necessarily go to a party and say, would you please hide, you know, this, for example. Okay, now another example of this kind of thing is that this is the uh, ACMG list. This is a list of, of uh, conditions that are considered actionable. ACMG had the idea that all doctors should be required if they see this to tell the patient about this. So these are actionable, serious genomic conditions. But you might imagine that a, a way this could go is that parties like GEDmatch prefer, might prefer not to see this kind of data. And so in other words, what they would do is that they would ask you to remove data that has very sensitive features before sending it to them so that they don't have that hanging around in their databases. All right, now, 
a, a naive way of approaching this would be to sign the whole file. And people have recommended doing that in suggested ways, and that has considerable value. But if you want to do this thing of leaving pieces out, this is going to be a problem because as soon as anything gets left out, the, the, the signatures don't check. Okay, and so another idea is you could take individual SNPs and sign them, but <clears throat> um, and, and then you could send the signatures for those. But when we're talking about 600,000 of these things, that's just too costly to do that. And there are other problems with the integrity of this technique. Okay, so what you want to do is to get things to sign as little as, you know, want to go back to the DT service as little as possible. And so a possible strategy, what we've been exploring with this is the idea of uh, using um, a, um, uh, something called a Merkle tree. And I'm going to just leave it there. Here's a Merkle tree because I, I want to make sure we have a little bit of time for questions here. And um, I'm happy to talk about anything further. I wanted to announce that we have a paper called Dove, a data oblivious virtual environment that is based on one of the IGB papers, this one here <coughs> on uh, honeybees. And so I'm working on my bona fides for being associated with IGB by showing that I can do work on bees. And so uh, this is a, a paper that uh, we just put out this week, actually. Okay, um, and I am going to just hop to saying the future work here is I have key goals uh, of deepening in the technology, of developing a broad legal and regulatory perspective, uh, and of testing um, usability and acceptance. And some of the, here's some of the people that are been, have you know been working uh, with me. Uh, and um, it's just to show a little bit of the diversity uh, of this is political science, genomic biology, um, uh, and College of Law and the Computer Science Department. Now, this is a, a GSP. It's built around security and privacy versus technology and policy. And so this is a, a, some of the core members of the group here and some of the different kinds of topics that come up from looking at this matrix including drivers like the DTC space. Okay, and I wanted to encourage, you know, please, uh, please be in touch with us. We'd be, uh, we're gonna do more events. So first of all, you could join the mailing list. <coughs> so here's a tiny URL version of that. And then uh, we have a meeting next week, actually. So at this time, a week from today, uh, we'll have a pioneers lecture by uh, Ellen Clayton from uh, Vanderbilt. Uh, Vanderbilt is one of the premier institutions uh, in the uh, area for uh, the, the GSP area. Uh, and uh, one of the leaders there is uh, Ellen Clayton, who is a lawyer and, and has uh, familiar with many different aspects of legal issues um, in, uh, in genomics. Okay, and I'll stop there and turn it over to Elena. Elena, you're muted. Yes, thank you. Um, that was great to hear uh, the beginning to end story about what you and your colleagues have been focusing on in GSP and um, CS. I think there were a, a lot of people here visiting from the law school that I hope will join us next week. And I, I see also a lot of different technical people. So I think you hit a wide range of audiences. We appreciate everyone being here. And I think um, Professor Gunter can take some questions. You can either type it in or um, unmute yourself. I have people great talk saying great talk. Thanks. I have a question. OK. Um, so there's been some news recently about uh, Google firing some of their AI ethicists. And that caused a lot of commotion in the news and concern from the public. Um, so I'm curious, how do you, you talked a little bit about policy, um, but how do you envision companies will actually adopt some of the approaches that you suggested for better practices of sharing genomic data? Do you think it's going to be through policy or consulting experts or maybe something else? There, there's some of the most interesting problems facing IG, uh, you know, GSP will be in that category. And um, I didn't include very much information about them today, uh, but um, uh, an example of the kind of issue is um, the uh, participation of indigenous groups uh, in studies. And so there, you know, you get a, um, a, a, a complex balance of goals. 
Like on the one hand, you want very high participation levels so everybody can benefit. On the other hand, uh, you, you want to protect the uh, interests of the groups if, if they, you know, and I guess the question here is when is it that you need to respect a group versus an individual? And so, you know, I very much see that this is a, a topic that, that we'll be, you know, bumping into and, and doing actually as a, as a core research mission. I, I, I you know, can view it as a reasonable thing for us to be as part of the general, um, uh, you know, scope of GSP to be concerned with this. So diversity of genomic data is kind of the key problem, which is you have some, as of a few years ago, about 80% of the DNA data was um, uh, of your, from people of European descent. And so uh, this has like negative effects. So an example of this was uh, a particular um, gene uh, was considered to have a, a, an allele that was worrying and, and thought to have bad health consequences. But after sufficient sequencing was done, they found African populations that had that gene very commonly in the population, which meant it was very unlikely to be anything particularly deleterious. And so that kind of starkly showed the um, <clears throat> importance uh, and value of uh, making sure that you have broad participation. So yeah, we'll be in that topic, I think. Thank you. Lots of other topics. We um, appreciate everyone listening in and uh, feel free to reach out to Carl over email too with any questions. Thanks, Carl. All right. Good to hear Thanks that. all.